Hi everybody, uh, welcome to week two. And so what that really means to you is that this summer term is rolling right along. Again, we only have 13 weeks and uh, many things to cover. And if I didn't say this really at the beginning, um, getting back to uh, the summer semester being 13 weeks, let me just say it now, because I've said it to a couple of people in emails. You know, necessarily because of you know, the fact that the summer term is 13 weeks versus um, the 17 weeks that the fall and spring semesters comprise, we necessarily can't talk about everything what I'd like to talk about in this course. So that is a bit of a loss for, you know, the students. and. And sometimes you come to the end of the term and say, hey, gosh, I wish we'd talk ab about this. And those things, <clears throat> when you come to the end of the term, I really do um, desire that kind of feedback. Um, if you say, look, I, I wish we'd spent a week or two more on this topic or included this other topic that we didn't cover, I, that's pretty valuable to me because <clears throat> it is a challenge really to do the, the summer term because it is compact and I don't really want to get in the mode of assigning students uh, a lot of extra reading per week. I, I'm not sure that's really the way to approach it. And so please do give me that feedback towards the end. Um, so let me get to, right into this week. Um, so I don't give you a lot of reading this week, although the reading I do give you is kind of a tougher slog especially the Federalist Papers. I want you to read numbers 10, 45, and 46. You probably have already read Federalist number 10. It talks about faction. Uh, that's sort of a backdrop um, because <clears throat> faction and tension, in my mind, are, are really two sides of the same coin. And then, so that sets up the reading of 45 and 46, which are about... Um, the tension really between states, what we call states in the United States, or you know other countries would call provinces, and the national government. Um, so really, I want you to read the Constitution itself. I have a link there. So read the Constitution itself with the amendments, all the amendments, uh, and then there's another link. Um, read pages nine through twenty-three, in which are somehow written in Roman numerals, I guess to sound more impressive. But um, pages 9 through 23, uh, would, these are the intro and the historical notes to what's called the Centennial Edition of the Constitution, which actually was um, chartered and published by the Senate, which is pretty impressive because it's actually a bipartisan publication. Um, and so that's it, really. But like I say, reading the Federalist Papers is always challenging, and it is true, if you've had me before, that I do have students read the Federalist Papers. I don't in every class. Um, I'd, I'd really love to squeeze them into every class. I just can't. I just can't squeeze them in in the context of every single class. But I really think they're important, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, so as I wind my way through this lecture, um, I will talk about this question, which is. Well, why the heck is the Constitution important? Um, I personally, I think historical context of the way government operates is important in public administration. Just as a as a uh, going in sort of assertion, I think that it's it's really important for students of public administration at the graduate level to have some understanding of the foundational elements of how we construct government in the United States. So um, if you work in government or you work for government, um, I think it's really important to have that context. Like why is separation of powers important to us in the United States? You know, because separation of powers is not uh, a necessary ingredient of democracy. There are many countries that don't have separation of powers necessarily between the executive and the legislative, but why do we think it's really important uh, as a hallmark of, of our form of constitutional democracy? Um, and so 
I think that background serves you well if you work in government. And even if you're a nonprofit person, so much of the work you do really, um, in many cases, has to do with carrying out government programs. And some of you have been involved in that world, actually. Um, that is, carrying out the uh, responsibilities of government through the vehicle of a nonprofit. And that goes on all the time, right? That goes on at the local level, the state level, and the national level. Uh, so it's really important, I think, just to understand the foundation of what we're talking about. So I throw in this first sentence, which says, what does the Constitution symbolize to us? That is, is the use of the word Constitution a trick to avoid debate? I gave you that really short little editorial from The Atlantic, written uh, about two or three years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, and the, the author says, tricks people use to avoid debate. And it's a really short editorial. Please read it. That's really interesting to me because what we do in language is we do have words that become code uh, for stop talking to me. I'm not going to debate this. Um, so there are a few words that people kick around to do that. Um, and the Constitution is one of them in my opinion. Now you can probably think of other words that um, and other terms that people use really to avoid debate. In other words if I use this code word and what I'm signaling to you is that my mind is made up and the word I just tossed at you is proof of that. Okay so deconstruct that a little bit just tossing out any word to anyone whether that's the term constitution or or the term check your privilege as the author of that editorial talks about i really necessarily haven't said anything um, of value in a in a debate scenario i've really just told you through a through a through code that you should just turn around and quit talking to me okay so when people use the word constitution, often what they're doing, they're not always doing this, um, but often what they're doing is they're saying, well, um, you clearly don't believe in the constitution or else you wouldn't say this. They don't have to say all that, but when they say, well, I support this because it's constitutional. But often they're not really not getting inside the constitution to even say what it is they really mean. So in my opinion, um, the the real the real foundation of the United States Constitution is tension. There are all kinds of tensions built into the Constitution and all kinds of tensions that underlie the writing of the Constitution itself. So for example, there was the historical tension between the colonies, that is a kind of an intramural sort of tension between the colonies in America and their allegiances. So just recall historically that some colonies were founded as basically corporations. Um, some colonies were founded as crown colonies. Some colonies were founded uh, to really under the auspices of parliament. Um, one colony at least was founded, Georgia, as a penal colony. So the colonies themselves, and, and also some colonies were, were founded by religious groups. So there's there's these allegiances, which weren't very old by, you know, the constitutional era, just a hundred or more, a hundred, 200 years old, these kinds of built in histories that each colony had and their own allegiances and their own cultures, if you will. So it wasn't as if all the American colonies were in unanimous agreement all the time about everything, because there's this whole set of tensions that have to do with their founding and their allegiances. And then there's, of course, the historical tension between king and parliament in Britain. Well, so the historical tension between king and parliament in Britain was is hundreds of years old by the, the founding era of the United States. That, that tension also informs the writing of the Constitution and the writing of the Declaration of Independence, you know, 15 years before that. So um the that tension is evident then there's tension between branches of government that is legislative executive judicial 
right? So our Constitution built three branches of government. And so just in the act of doing that, tension was set up if it wasn't already there. And we transferred that tension by the Constitution to the states, to every one of the states. So in every single state, we have some form of separation of powers, legislative, executive, judicial. The fact is that governors are more or less empowered by state constitutions. Um, in some states, the governor is very empowered. In some states, the governor is limited by the legislature constitutionally. So, but there is that tension, right? That is separation of powers. That is what we call separation of powers. Um, and then there's a philosophical tension over control of the armed forces. So I'm, I'm interested in that one because of my background. But the point is that if you live in 2019, um, you've never lived in a time, probably, unless you're quite old, uh, you've never lived in a time when there wasn't something called the Department of Defense. Well, the, the founders didn't set up something called the Department of Defense. One of the reasons they didn't is because they didn't want a unified armed force. They, there was a tension about who really controls the armed forces. Is it the president or is it the Congress? Is it the central government or is it the states? There was a tension and that tension is reflected in the words of the Constitution. There's a philosophical tension between what we call democracy and what we call republicanism. So, you know, classic republicanism or classic democracy, that is, should we be more interested in empowering the people as a whole, or should we be more interested in empowering a group of elected legislators and others who are who come to office through the device of elections and other devices to run the country, right? So that's kind of a tension really between the Jeffersonian view of democracy and more of the the Hamiltonian view of democracy, right? Um, and then there's a tension between advocates of centralization and advocates of decentralization. That is one of the major arguments that was part and parcel of the debate over the Constitution. Should the central government be more empowered you know, versus the states, or should the states be more empowered? And then later, identified by Wilson and Goodnow, which you've all read in 8050 and elsewhere, is the tension between what, what Wilson called politics and administration, right? So that is what government does, what government purports to do through policy. It is influenced by what Wilson called politics, and he described as some something like a sort of a messy enterprise and administration, which Wilson described as business-like, right? And so Wilson automatically privileged business because he wants the reader to assume that business is always rational. What is it? You know, um, but is politics, is politics messy and administration rational? That's, that's the tension, right? And then all these, these sort of tensions rolled up in, when the Constitution was written between what were called Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and they both wrote papers. And these papers really were a series of op-eds, if you will, in newspapers, mostly in New York and Virginia, um, to influence the, really to influence whether or not the Constitution would be ratified in the states of New York and Virginia. And so they didn't, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists didn't sit down together and write books. You can get both the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers, and probably you should. Actually, you can get them on Amazon for less than $10 each. Um, but we, we came to characterize the, this argumentation as a debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. But what they were talking about was what the Constitution meant. They were talking about that in 1788 uh, when when the Constitution was still being ratified by the various states. So there's all these tensions. And so my point with talking about tensions is this. We still talk about tensions. These tensions are still uh, a, a really big part of 
the things we argue about in government, um, we still argue about the power of the presidency versus the power of Congress, right? We still argue about the power of the Supreme Court to strike down laws. We still argue uh, about politics and administration, politics versus administration. We still argue about all these things. So they're really sort of part of our political culture in the United States, which started with uh, the Constitution. So here's a little chronology. I sourced, I, I had this source called Carrie and McClellan. I don't make you read Carrie and McClellan. I used to have people read this. But what, I, what substitutes for that source now is that introduction on that link to the Constitution. So uh, from Kerry and McClellan, the United States Constitution is, in fact, uh, the oldest written national constitution still in force, sort of as a unitary document. Um, there are other constitutions older, i.e. the British Constitution, but the British Constitution is not really one unitary document. Um, the the issue was that elites, and I use that term not as a pejorative, but in fact, the Constitution was written by political elites. Um, elites were divided on the need to create a stronger state constitutional structure. So the three major tasks of the 1787 Constitutional Convention are reflected in the wording itself. Um, the first task was to improve the relationship among the states. That is, in the preamble of the Constitution, you see this term, in order to form a more perfect union. That was not some esoteric term. Uh, you know, it was, it meant to say, we're forming a more complete union than we had under the Articles of Confederation. The second thing was to design a federal system with limited, delegated, and enumerated powers to the central government and the remainder reserved to the states. So again, back to this tension. The task was to say which powers of government belonged to the federal government and or the central government. They didn't call it the federal government then, but which tasks belonged to the central government and which tasks belonged to the states. So that is federalism, right? Federalism means that more than one political entity has jurisdiction or sovereignty over the same, basically over the same geographic area. And so how do you divide power between those two levels of government? And then the third was to implement the principle of government by consent. So that's that's actually meaningful. And it goes back to the, the Declaration of Independence, which asserted that, you know, in the course of human events, a people has a right to break with the government because it's not governing by the consent of the governed. So the Constitution itself was advocated by people like Madison Hamilton, who thought the Articles of Confederation were weak, and that 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 governing document and the way the way it made uh, decisions was ineffective. So the interesting thing about the Articles of Confederation with the full title there, the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union is really more of a treaty than a genuine constitution, according to Kerry and McClellan. And, and really that, that, that has a good point. It's really more like um, Belgium. If, if you have seen the constitution of Belgium, um, it's a lot like that. Power was vested in this Congress, but there was a real, I mean, all power was vested in this Congress. There was no real separation of powers, no judicial, no real executive, right? The states had those things, but the Congress didn't. So it, it was more like a giant committee, right? But at the national level. Um, it And so that committee required unanimous consent for most actions. So imagine 13 members of the committee agreeing on every single action all the time, right? There was an issue of the Continental Army pay. Um, you know, well, so many of the soldiers that had fought the revolution hadn't been paid in years. In fact, there was a, there was threat of a coup, um, a real coup, um, to take over the government because the people with guns hadn't been paid. Um, and so there was a bit of uh, a bit of urgency there. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, the states themselves were experimenting with constitutions. So Massachusetts 
had its own constitutional convention. Um, in fact, Massachusetts uh, has an, an older constitution than the United States. That's, that's actually still in force, the Massachusetts written, the Massachusetts constitution. Um, there were some attempts, some halted attempts to try to address weaknesses in the Article of Confederation, including in 1786, which only five, all states were invited to, but only five states attended. And they said, look, we need, we need to do better than this. And so in 1787, um, the Continental Congress agreed with the idea that there should be something of a convention to revise the Articles of Confederation. Well, they went way beyond that, right? So, so in the summer of 80, 1787, the Constitution was written. That's the short story. Okay, but it's informed by all these tensions I keep talking about. So right away, on opening day practically, Madison shows up with something called the Virginia Plan. Well, the Virginia Plan really favored the populous states like Virginia and New York, right? So what it said was that there would be um, – one, there would be Congress, a Congress really, which was based on the size of the state. So proportional, right? So the representation scheme heavily favored um, larger states. Well, that was too much to the chagrin of states like New Jersey, who said, look, the one thing we like about the Articles of Confederation is it's that every single state has equal representation, right? So the first great compromise, and this is the one that's called the Great Compromise, created the House of Representation with proportional representation and the Senate with equal state representation. Now, interestingly enough, um, or tragically enough, I suppose, you know, the the proportional representation in the House of Representatives included included something called the Three Fifths Compromise, which was another compromise. Um, which basically said that each person enslaved would count as three-fifths of a person. Um, so were they saying that, that slaves were only worth three-fifths of a human being? Probably not. They, in fact, most of them probably thought slaves weren't, you know, weren't actually equivalent to a human being at all, tragically. Um, what they were saying was that the southern states, mostly, who held slaves should get more representation in Congress simply because they held slaves. That's really what they were saying with the three-fifths compromise. Um, and yes, that was, was that uh, compromise with evil? I think I hold that interpretation in a sense. The, but the counter argument is that without that, the constitution would not have been agreed upon either. So there, there were many compromises that were made in writing the constitution. So uh, along come the Federalist Papers, and the only reason I talk about the Federalist Papers in this context, in this order, is because uh, there is a very real possibility that this Constitution, written by the end of the summer of 1787, was not going to be ratified by the states. So the plan said that nine of the 13 states had to ratify the Constitution in order for it to take effect. Well, in fact, uh, nine of the states did ratify the Constitution. However, by 1788, um, by approaching summer of 1788, New York and Virginia had not ratified the Constitution yet. So even though nine of 13 states could stand up and say, you know, we are the United States of America, that would have left several states out, including New York and Virginia. And so the problem with that is they're the most populous states. And so what would the relationship be between this new United States and New York and Virginia? So um, Madison, Hamilton, and John Jay, who got ill uh, while these op-eds were being written, wrote these Federalist Papers. And so they didn't write the Federalist Papers as a book. And the Anti-Federalists didn't write their papers as a book. They wrote them as back and forth uh, op-eds and answers to each other in various newspapers in those states. Well, in fact, some of the that's that's kind of a good context to think of it because some of the uh, papers themselves are actually fairly caustic. I mean, they are in the form of a debate, and they they do reflect a very emotional debate that was going on at the time. So 
if you think of it as, um, you know, sort of Twitter expanded, th that's what's going on with the Federalist Papers. And so we, you know, later publishers came along and reorganized them into sort of this subject matter order. And so they're easier to digest as a whole if you're actually going to do that uh, in this subject matter order, but they really weren't written that way. Okay, so part one, um, which were some of the earlier ones, talk about the advantages of a more perfect union. So what Hamilton and Madison assert is that Americans are already one people. Um, but the biggest thing they assert with these early Federalist Papers is that there's more advantages to having a unified United States than a United States composed of 13 separate states who happen to get along with each other most of the time. And, and they said, you know, some of the advantages were these things on the list. There's greater national security with a unified armed force. There's less chance of interstate conflicts that could actually re lead to wars between the states. Um, there's commercial advantages whereby the United States represents itself as, as a single commercial power vis-a-vis uh, -vis England, Spain, France, instead of Virginia representing itself to those countries or New York representing itself to those countries. So that's part one. Part two, they start to point out the weaknesses of the existing Confederation. And these really were, were pretty apparent. Um, and the, the main weakness with the Articles of Confederation was that it, it was a committee and it really legislated for the states, not the individuals. In other words, the Articles of, Articles of Confederation was a, an arrangement to uh, govern the relationship between the states themselves as corporate entities, if you will, and not individual Americans. So there was nothing in the Articles of Confederation that really spoke to the rights of individual Americans. It really just talked about how this committee gets along with each other, right? Uh, it was more of a collaboration and less of a country. Um, the Articles of Confederation had a really hard time defining uh, state portfolios versus legislative portfolios. So what the Constitution did was it said, look, commerce, national commerce, finance, treaty negotiation, war, those all belong to the national government. The states still own private justice, that is criminal law mostly, agriculture and other concerns, right? And so still, even today, you know, we do think of areas that belong strictly to the states and areas that belong strictly to the national government, and we still argue about it. We still have tension. K-12 education is one of the is one of the classic areas where there is still tension between the national government and the state governments, right? Because many people assert that K-12 education is strictly a state concern and the national government has no role in it whatsoever. Um, and in fact, funding uh, still comes mostly from state and local sources. So that's part two. Part three, um, part three, they, Madison and Hamilton argue and assert and advocate a lot of things about what the national government really should be doing. Um, and the anti-federalists, well, the anti-federalists didn't really go along with them. And so part of these um, papers in the 20s really were the core of the argument because the anti-federalists were very opposed to centralization, right? Um, so one of the powers exercised by the national government should be um, the national military and that states really shouldn't assume any power over the national military. I'm gonna to get to that in a minute, how that how that fell out. Um, they, wanted to, they wanted to minimize the fear of a national army using force domestically through various devices. So they actually set up the state militias. Um, and they wanted the, the national government to have taxation powers. But at the time, what they said was this was external taxation. So things like duties and tariffs. So that is any products being imported into the United States, for example, whether they came into the port of Charleston or whether they came into the port of Boston, the the duties and the tariffs would be uniformly applied as opposed to each state setting its own duties and tariffs. So part four talks about 
why the Constitution conforms with principles of republicanism. So this is actually, in a sense, more philosophical, this particular set of um, the Federalist Papers. But what they're really talking about there is why the structure that was set up, that is, the two branches or the two houses of Congress, that is the Senate and the House, the executive, that is the president, and the courts, the judiciary, why these were important and how they actually promote republicanism and not tyranny, as many of the anti-federalists argue, right? So they set up a system where they said in 45 and 46 that the states actually have the largest share of power. Interestingly, those are that's what you're reading this week, so does it really say that? Um, that separation of powers between branches prevents tyranny by one. That is an argument that we're still having, right? So how strong is the presidency versus Congress? And should the presidency be as strong as it is uh, compared to Congress? Oh, we're still having that argument 230 years later, right? Um, the House of Representatives, does it provide an acceptable re representation of the people? And does the Senate promote stability and interests of the states? So that is in fact why the House of Representatives members have two-year terms and senators have six-year terms. The thinking behind that was that the Senate promoted stability. The House of Representatives promoted the changing desires of the people or what were called the people then. So we also have to admit that the franchise was very limited in 1787. No one thought women should vote. Uh, certainly no one was going to give slaves the right to vote. And in many cases, in many states, no one was going to give white males who didn't happen to own property the right to vote. And no one was going to give Native Americans the right to vote. So um, if you want to argue that um, racism is inherent in the Constitution, you, I think you probably have a pretty good case. That's not what I happen to be discussing here. I'm, I'm talking about the Constitution structurally. But I think that, um, you know, that's an argument that we can continue to have and kind of goes back to my, my, my initial statement that we shouldn't, that people shouldn't just use the word Constitution as a term to end all debate, because there are plenty of things that we can and should debate about the Constitution. Um, and so presidential election, let me get to that, was a, uh, was actually not a democratic process. There was this weird thing set up called the Electoral College, right? Um, the Electoral College, as originally dreamed up, I mean, they sort of just invented it out of whole cloth, was, was a way to stop a tyrant from being popularly elected. I mean, that's really the case. People now say the Electoral College um, assures that small states have a voice. And that is true. But that underlies the entire debate about con the Constitution. That is, large states and small states need to have some equal footing in a lot of areas. But but that really wasn't, if you read read these Federalist Papers in the, in the 67, 68, 69, what the the Electoral College was really about was trying to form a deliberative body that was separately elected to then elect a president of the United States. Pretty interesting debate there. Okay, and so in case we forget, the Constitution of 1787 is probably not what people today reference when they're trying to end all debate by saying the word constitution. The House of Representatives was proportional and it does have this infamous three-fifths clause. Um, the Senate was elected indirectly and that is it was elected by state legislatures. It wasn't until um, the, the night the 17th amendment that we changed the vote to senators by popular vote. Some states had already done that by the time of the, the amendment. But, but in 1787, no one was going to elect senators by popular vote. They were going to be appointed essentially by each state's legislature. And that is, they represented the interests of the states, not the interests of the people in the states. 
you have to sort of wrap your mind around that subtle distinction. Um, and that the president was indirectly um, voted by electors, as I stated, not directly by the people. Um, the office of vice president is only is mentioned in Article One and Article Two. So Article One, the the uh, legislative article, and Article Two, the executive article. But the only jobs that the vice president are given are president of the Senate and becoming president should the president become able to serve. So what you know what does this president of the Senate thing mean? Well, it turns out that the very first vice president, John Adams, really didn't like sitting in the Senate. I mean, he just didn't. He spoke disparagingly about it. He he was bored by all the debate among the senators. And so he really didn't um, take the office of president of the Senate necessarily to heart, and he, he tried to avoid it. And so it became kind of ceremonial, right? I mean, the vice president still can vote in the Senate when there's a tie, but but typically the vice president of the United States does not sit in the Senate day after day. Well, that might be because of the pres the precedent <laughs> that Adams set. Uh, now, just kind of play this thought game. What if John Adams had decided to really take on that role vigorously and say, you know, look, I'm president of the Senate um, and I'm going to insist that the Senate have a seat at the table with the president of the United States. Because remember, that's my next bullet, there was no assumption that the president and the vice president were going to be on the same team politically. Um, people didn't run on party tickets until 1800, and then we had to come up with the 12th Amendment to accommodate that. There was a built-in assumption, in fact, that the president and the vice president probably had some areas of disagreement with each other. And the first place vote getter was going to become president. The second place vote getter was going to become vice president. I mean, what would have happened if, if Adams had strengthened the role of vice president and become something like a prime minister? It really would have changed a lot of things. Um, the Supreme Court and other federal judiciary appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate, we know that. Um, but advice and consent is actually built into the whole senatorial role. So the question is, and this is this is a question that Professor John Rohr talks about. The question is, you know, was the Senate actually set up to be something like a council of state for the president? Now, it would be pretty unwieldy now when we think of, you know, a um, hundred senators. It it would be easier to manage. If you think of 26 senators, still that's a pretty big group. But um, but 100 senators could that be a council of state? So in other words, was the Senate actually set up to be something as a function that straddled both the executive and, and legislative? And then finally, um, that well, a couple of things. The Bill of Rights that we often refer to wasn't written yet when the Constitution was, but it was something like a promissory note because the Anti-Federalists in some states had had made that part of the ratification they said yeah our state will ratify if you write a bill of rights so madison took that on and so what we now know is the bill of rights the first 10 amendments was finally ratified in 1791 a couple years later but the federal government had weak taxation rights and that had to do with the assumption that the states did most of the taxing right the taxes should be local okay so what about the tensions right so what we know now is that tension over control of the military evolved. So right now, you know, we know that the national government is supreme. We do have what we call National Guard units in every single state, mostly Army and Air Force National Guard. Uh, the, those units actually um, are mostly funded by the Army and the Air Force in the Department of Defense budgets. Well, that, I mean, that's not what was set up originally. What was set up originally was a, was a small central military an army and a navy, and state militias, which were ground units, controlled at the state level, which would become part of the national military when called into service by the president and Congress. Called into service by Congress, actually, that's an important distinction, and then commanded by the president when in use. The tension between the branches of government still remains 
today, right? But it manifests itself in different eras. So think about the importance of the Supreme Court in interpreting the Constitution. Um, think about the up and down tensions between the legislative and the executive. You know, a lot of people contend that, you know, tension between the legislative and executive is a fairly recent thing. It's not. It's 230 years old. It just has had a lot of up and down uh, sporadic turns um, over history. Uh, the strong executive, you know, that's what you're reading 8050, right? The Hamiltonian view is that we should have a strong and vibrant executive, right? But the fact is that many of the powers of Congress have been usurped by various presidents for the last, you know, couple of centuries, more and more into the 20th century. So it, the idea of executive budgeting, um, going to war, increasing executive orders, these are all examples of presidents over time not just recently, but over time, taking on more and more congressional authority. And so the tension between the states and the national government still are very important, even while cooperation and collaboration still take place, right? And so tension over the meaning of the Constitution. So, you know, this kind of goes back into one of the readings where there's a couple paragraphs in that introduction on you know, do we believe in an originalist constitution or do we believe in a living constitution? Well, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but what I would say is that if it, if the constitutional wording itself were so straightforward, uh, why have we had so many Supreme Court rulings over the last 230 years, basically, 220 years? Why have we had so many constitutional rulings wherein the Supreme Court itself told the people who wrote the law, well, you said that, but that's unconstitutional. Or you said that, but you're not very clear. Or you said that, but here's what it really means. So there is tension in what the words of the Constitution actually mean. Okay, so here is the discussion board, and it's going to be in groups. I'm going to get to that in a second, but let me, let me just sort of answer the so what question here, because I think the so what question is important. So, so what, why in a 13 week summer term, you know, on intergovernmental management, am I talking about the constitution and the Federalist Papers? The so what is that it, it really has implications for everything we do in government work and, and in nonprofit, at least the nonprofit that does work on behalf of governments. And so my, my point is that tension is, is an inherent part of the relationships between governments. So the tension is an inherent part of the relationship between the national government, what we always call the federal government, and the state governments and the local governments. That tension is also inherent in governments at what you might call peer levels tensions between states, but more often tensions between smaller units of government, and that is cities and towns and counties and school districts, which are all theoretically anyway, under the control of the state. But those tensions, legal and otherwise, are very uh, apparent in what goes on at state level and local level in terms of policy and in terms of taxation and in terms of administration. And we can see those those policies um, in tension, even if we look at our own state of Nebraska. As I am giving this lecture, the unicameral is still in session and they are arguing about, right now they are arguing about property tax relief. And so the tension is, should there be property tax relief can you do that without talking about K-12 education and the way K-12 education in the state of Nebraska is supported through taxation? Well, the answer the legislature has so far is no, you can't do that. You have to, if you're gonna reform taxes, you have to talk about not only property tax, but you have to talk about uh, income tax and you have to talk about sales tax because for the things the state of Nebraska does, the money has to come from somewhere 
And so now you have to talk about three kinds of taxation, but you also have to talk about what is the formula for supporting the public school system in Nebraska. And so tensions are just part of the way we do government in the United States. And so going all the way back to the Constitution, my point is that tension is sort of built into the mix. It's cooked in, if you will. Um, and so what I'd like you to do for this uh, discussion, 45 and 46 are about the tension between state and national. And I've assigned you in groups. Uh, and by the way, you should just pop up as one group. You should be able to only view one group discussion. If it doesn't work that way, please let me know because I set up Canvas to assign each of you to either group one or group two. Um, so I want you to talk about either um, Federalist Paper number 45 or Federalist Paper number 46, and then you should only be able to comment back to each other using this format, which uh, I borrowed. It's called the 321 format. So uh, first thing, discuss the author's three main points. Second thing, discuss two aspects you don't understand very well. Uh, and the third thing is, suggest one question you might have for the author of the paper. So I ask you to write that by Thursday and then provide a substantive feedback to at least one student within your assigned group by Saturday. So here's some of the references that I used in today's lecture. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.